Well, it's time to do a little work, so I'm going to roll up my sleeves. You might want to do this as well if you're, you know, if you're, if you're not ready to work. You, well, you know, Annie, I know you got on a short sleeve shirt. I'm rolling up my sleeves because I'm about to do some work. You know, the Spirit, we've talked about for several weeks, the Spirit has given us gifts. In fact, I'm really going to work hard. How do you like that? The Spirit has given us gifts. We've talked about those gifts. We've, we've, we've kind of learned maybe some new things that we didn't understand about the Holy Spirit and what His purpose is for us. But His purpose for us is this, that we would take those gifts and that we would work with them. Now, I didn't say use them because they're not really ours to use but that we would work with them. God has given them to us so that we can go out and bless and, and bring his word to everyone. Amen? So we've talked about these gifts and we've talked about what they, you know, some of them are. Well, today, I'm going to go through the list for you. So um, it's, it's going to take me a couple of minutes maybe to read this, but bear with me. Dear brothers and sisters, now, before we start, why did he say, dear brothers and sisters? Who's your neighbor? Who's your brother and sister? Jesus said, my mother and my brothers are those who are here with me today. Brothers and sisters, regarding your question about the special abilities the Spirit gives us, I don't want you to misunderstand this. You know that when you were still pagans, you were led astray and swept along in worshiping speechless idols. Idol number one. Yeah, topple your idol. That's good. Do you know, you'll probably see that light up today during my sermon. Because every week during my sermon, I get text messages, phone calls, and people asking, how, we, how can I help them? Pastor, I'm stranded here. I know you don't know me, but... And I feel that vibrate against my heart. Listen, I feel it vibrate against my heart. And my heart cries out, let me help. But I also know that my time with God is more important than my time with anything else. Is that all it gets, one amen? amen? I want you to know that no one is speaking by the Spirit. No one who is speaking by the Spirit will curse Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of all. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. As Helen came up today and said, we are called one of our gifts is that of servanthood. Well, that is a gift that we all share in. Thus, the Spirit gives us that gift of being a servant. And do you know why that is? Because the Spirit advocates for us in Jesus' stead. He is not standing next to us, teaching us. But He said to us, through His Word, we read, that He said, it is your job to take care of those less fortunate than you. It's your job to look out for widows and orphans. It's your job to help them in their time of need. He wasn't just talking to a few of us. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but in the same, it is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. To one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice or good counsel. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge or insight, wisdom. The same Spirit gives great faith to another and to someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing he gives one person the, the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy. 
He gives someone else the ability to discern whether the message is from the Spirit of God or from another spirit. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. It is the one and only Spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. Do you know what your gift is? I mean, if, if I had heard a lot of people say, yes, yeah, I know what my gift is, I would have been stunned. Because at any given moment, I feel like God has blessed me with each of these gifts for each specific purpose. If I'm talking to someone who is desperately ill and they've virtually given up on life, he gives me the spirit of encouragement he gives me the spirit of prayer. I may be talking to an unbeliever, someone who says God wouldn't do that. And I can respond in the spirit of great faith. Some of us are hurt. We've been hurt by the church. We've been hurt by people who in the name of Jesus have told us things that we knew were not right. Or am I the only one? That's the spirit of discernment. The spirit says to you, when you hear something and you know there's, it's not right, that's the spirit of discernment. Gary and I have a little running joke. He'll ask me a question and I'll answer. <clears throat> and if I don't answer truthfully, he'll look me straight in the eye and say, you're lying to me. I don't know if that's the gift of discernment. I'm just not a very good liar. <clears throat> because I tend to have a little half smile when I say it. I can't help it. I don't know. <laughs> we have the same Holy Spirit. There aren't 5,000 different Holy Spirits. There aren't 5 million. There aren't 5 billion. There's one. One who gives us these gifts. Here's idol number one, right? A couple of weeks ago, someone said, Pastor, I'm glad you cut this short because I got to get home and watch the game. <laughs> no, 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 don't laugh. No, it's not meant to be funny. It's not meant to be funny because I've been in that situation. I've sat in a pew and I've thought to myself, when is he going to shut up? Dude, you have said enough. Just stop. <laughs> We're all going to say a special prayer for Gary this week. <laughs> oh, yeah, he can deal it out, but he can't take it. God has a message for you. And that message may not come through me. That message may come from one of your very best friends. It may come from your mom or your dad or your son or your daughter. It may come from someone you least expect it to come from. But God has a message for you. And it's by his Holy Spirit that you are allowed to hear and understand that message. Now the Bible tells us, as I just said, that some of us are 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 given the gift of healing. And, and I've seen miraculous healings. W one of my most wonderful gifts is sitting here with us today. Margie, would you say that you received the gift of healing? Jim, would you say that? And, and there are others. I know there are others. God gives some the gift of healing. When we circled around her and we prayed, we joined hands and we joined spirits and we prayed. Do you understand? So when God was using his spirit of healing, it wasn't through one of us. It was through all of us agreeing together in prayer. Some he gives a gift to prophesy. Well, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? I mean, I hear people talking about prophecy and, and what, what's about to happen. And, you know, prophecy is not necessarily only about 
the end of time. Prophecy can be about when you feel like you have to talk to someone about Jesus, when you are absolutely compelled. Now, how is that a prophetic spirit? Because God knows that that person needs to be spoken to at that moment. And he sends to you through his spirit a spirit of prophecy. And he says to you, you're going to feel stupid, I know it, but you talk to that person about Jesus. And if they spit in your eye and they walk away, you planted the seed. You did what I told you to do. Now I'm going to get back to, I hope he doesn't go too long because of the game. It, 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 I sit in front of an idol, a big flat screen TV, beautiful, oh man, you can see the game just like they're right there. It's like looking through a window. And you know, when I sacrifice time with my Lord for that idol, I'm doing the thing that he said, absolutely, you will never do. You will not put any other God or idol before me because I am one God and I am a jealous God. And we don't hear that a lot, do we? We don't hear from the pulpit that God is a jealous God. Well, he should be a jealous God. Everything that we have was given to us by him. And how dare we sit in front of an idol that he gave us and worship that idol and take away time from him? I, I set this up here for a reason. Last weekend, last Sunday, in the middle of the pastor's prayer, in the middle of the prayer, when I really felt like God was just compelling me to say something, my phone rang. Now, I was kneeling in front of the altar, so I didn't answer my phone. But I have been in prayer before, and my phone has rang, and I have answered my phone. I have stopped praying to answer my phone. I know I'm the only one. I not only supplanted God with this device, I gave it my worship. I was in the middle of being united with my God through prayer, and I cut that off to answer a phone. Shame on me. Paul goes on and says, the, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles, some are slaves and some are free, but we all have been baptized into one body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. We might have different gifts, but we share the same spirit. Last week I talked to you about foot and mouth disease. If I'm a foot, I don't want to be a foot. I want to be the mouth. Listen to this. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one. If the foot says, I'm not, part of, I'm not a part of the body because I'm not a hand, that doesn't make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear says, I'm not part of the body because I'm not an eye, would that make it any less a part of the body? If the whole body were an eye, how would you hear? Or if your whole body were an ear, how would you smell anything? But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where he wants it. The Bible tells us that beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. Now, I don't know about you, but... Feet are ugly, and that's why I cover them up. They're not, they're practical, right? We use them to walk. We use them, if we're young, we use them to kick a ball around. I use it to kick the dog sometimes. But, but we, we have a practical use for our feet. They're utilitarian. They're there for a purpose, to help us walk, to make sure we stand upright. But did you know that the ear is equally a part of walking as the feet? Did you know that? Lindsay, I know you know that. You get an ear infection. Dr. Sue, you get an ear infection. And suddenly you can't hold your head up because you get dizzy. And before long, you have to sit down. 
Think about it. Think about it. Every part of your body is connected in some way to form a whole. Just like every part of the body of Christ is knitted together to serve one God. Well, you know, Pastor, I, I don't have a lot of money to give. I want to give to the church. I wish I had the money to just to, to put the new roof on the education bill. I wish I had that. I, if I had it, I'd do it. And you know what I say to that? Don't tell me. Don't tell me. I love you. I don't care. I don't care if you got anything. Tell God. If you want something from your God that you know by your spirit he wants as much as you, if you don't ask him, the Bible says you got to ask. And it may not be asked once. It may be asked twice or ten times or a hundred times or until you take your last, last breath. It might be that all you do from now on is ask him. But Jesus said, everyone who asks will receive. How strange a body would be if it had only one part. Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In our church today, in our modern church, the church, we have a whole lot of people who want to be the mouth. Amen? A whole lot of people want to be the mouth. And so they go out into the world and they act like the mouth. But if the mouth is what gives the true word and you're not the mouth, you better shut up. Remember Senior Wences? It's all right. The hand is not the mouth. If God has called you to be a hand, don't try to be the mouth. If God's called you to be a mouth, use the spirit of discernment to know when to speak. And when he hasn't given you permission to speak, shut up. I say shut up in love. But for heaven's sake, and I literally mean for heaven's sake, shut up. There are so many people that I talk to, most younger than me, most somewhere in between my age and Colin's age, who, who just are offended by the idea of church. And you know why? Because they've been to church. And everybody thinks they're a mouth. And everybody thinks that they have some word from God. And everybody's picks out every little thing that you do wrong, and because they're a mouth, they get to tell you. Guess what? Not everybody's a mouth. What good would a mouth be without a brain? Because a lot of people don't use them both at the same time. <laughs> to talk to someone that you know God has laid on your heart and for them to say, I can't, don't even talk to me about church. I don't, don't even say that word to me. Do you understand that that is maybe the worst thing that you could say? But I've got an answer. I've got an answer. You know, Jesus very rarely stepped foot in the church. You really should listen. Jesus very rarely stepped foot in the church. And when he did, he opened his mouth to stir up controversy. And if you don't believe that's true, you dust it off and read it. When he went into the church, he was the mouth, brother, and he had something to say. And the people who heard it, they weren't the ear, they were the behind. <laughs> right? Because we, right? I won't go into specifics. But anyway, they, didn't want, they did not want to hear. In fact, they were so adamant against hearing what he had to say that they literally turned their backs on him. 
You have nothing to say to us. We know exactly what God wants. He wants us to perform this sacrifice at this specific time of day, wearing this specific garb. He wants us to do things the way he told us to. Really? I have an answer for you when someone says to you, I don't want to hear about church. Say, good, because I don't like church either. No, I'm serious. If somebody says religion has, is just worthless, say, yeah, you're right. Religion is worthless. I don't have religion. I have a relationship. I have a relationship with my Savior. Church is a building to most people. They won't step foot in it because they have before. And everybody with a mouth told them everything that they thought was in their head. You don't have to ascribe to any specific denomination. I know I'm in, I'm in a Methodist church. <laughs> Jesus never said, Peter, I call you not the rock, I call you Methodist. And John, I call you the Baptist. And did you catch my pun there? Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus said we are the church and we are to do what he tells us by his Holy Spirit, and that is to go into all the world preaching the gospel, the good news that Jesus will save you if you will simply ask. Save me from what? So what's, what's he going to, yeah, from myself, that's good. What's he going to save me from? How about this? From the torture of hell. Do you know you know right now there are churches in Evansville, churches that have the, the cross of Christ in their, in their sanctuary. They're, they're, they won't even say the word hell because that's a bad word. It's a four-letter word, isn't it? We don't say hell. It was in a book that I was reading to my students not too long ago, and they went, oh! They couldn't believe it. And I said, guys, just Relax. We're talking about something different here. They won't even say the word hell because if they say the word hell, then the person who puts the most money in the, in the, in the coffer here might get offended and leave. Oh, I can't say that. I can't say hell because it'll offend so-and-so and, and they'll leave. They'll go to another church. You know what I say? Good. <laughs> Bye. I mean, don't get me wrong, it takes this to run the building. It takes this to pay the bills. It takes this to do the work that God has called us to do. However, Jesus said, if you've got a penny in your pocket, give it away. D oh, you don't remember that part? You don't remember the, the parable of the widow's mite? When the rich young man walks into the synagogue and he lays money on the and he is just so proud of himself because he's laid all the money on the altar look what i've done and he actually went around to people saying look what i've done you see all that money i put on there i built the new wing over there that's right i did it and then jesus said a poor widow who had nothing to her name but one tiny coin walked in humbly and laid that coin on the altar and Jesus said, who do you think got the bigger blessing? He got his blessing already, didn't he? Look what I did. Look what I did. And she went in humbly and she laid it on the altar. And you know what? She, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that she was thinking this. God, I'm sorry, but this is all I've got. I hope that you'll accept it. And do you know that because... That was everything that she had. That was the greatest gift she could have given at that time. Maybe your gift is generosity. Maybe your gift is to, when it comes time to, to pay for something, you step up and you say, I will take care of that. Praise God for you. Maybe you have a gift of prayer and you pray without ceasing. Guess what? We're all supposed to do that. We're all supposed to give out of the generosity of our hearts. We're all supposed to pray without ceasing. We're all supposed to, 
to do the things that Jesus told us to do. Not because he suggested that it might be something good. He said, do it. I'm almost done, Gary. Just relax. In fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. I'm going to read that again so you can hear it. In fact, some of the parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable than those we clothe with the greatest care, so we carefully protect those parts that should not be seen, while the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together in such an extra honor and care, and they are given to these parts that have less dignity. That little woman who walked in and said, I'm sorry, but this is all I've got. Who was the one who was blessed? I know sometimes you come here and you think, what am I doing here? I have nothing to offer. I have nothing to give. Yes, you do. I hope that scared you. <laughs> Not only do you have something to give, God has specifically given it to you to give away. Why don't I ever have money? Because I give it away. I, there are times when I want to say, no, this is all I've got. And then I always do it anyway. Peter writes to us, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to the entire world. So be happy when you're insulted for being a Christian for, these, for then the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must, must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into others' affairs curl your toes but it is no shame to suffer for being a christian praise god for the privilege of being called by his name exclamation point for the time has come for judgment and it must begin with god's house and if judgment begins with us what terrifying and terrible fate awaits those who have never obeyed God's good news? And he says also, if the righteous are barely saved, what will happen to godless sinners? So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right and trust your lives to the God who created you, for he will never fail you. I'm a foot and I'm proud. Right? I'm an ear and I'm proud. I'm a little finger. You know, a little finger doesn't really do a whole lot, does it? But it makes you look awful fancy when you drink tea. <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it is that God has called you to be, be it with everything that you can. Do you understand? Because he said to, you, to us, there are only two commandments. Love God with everything you have, including the gifts he gives you, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's it. That's it. I don't want to stand up here and offend anybody, but you know what? I've done it. For that, I'm sorry. If I offend you, I'm sorry. I'm the one who has to stand in judgment for it, not you. If I've offended you, I'm sorry, and I'll answer for it. But I'm not going to compromise the Word of God and not worry about offending somebody. I, I could not care less. If I offend you because I preach the Word of God, if I offend you because the Word of God strikes at your heart and convicts you, if, if, if I offend you because I want to be one with my Lord, that's yours to deal with, and you'll stand in judgment for it. 
God has gifts for you. God has nothing but love for you. Nothing but love. But friends, brothers and sisters, my family, when we sit in judgment of someone else under any circumstance, we are, going, we are putting that up as much as any other idol we own. When we sit in judgment, we assume to take God's throne away from him. Because the Bible tells us that he alone will judge. Listen, he alone will judge. If on a hot summer day in July, somebody walks in here with long hair and cut off sleeves and cut off shorts and wants to have church, I'm gonna, I, I'll welcome up here. And if that offends you, well, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to step on anybody's toes intentionally. Well, maybe I am, but I'm not intentionally trying to offend you. I'm saying that you should count it as all glory when you are considered spiteful for the name of Jesus. You should consider it a great blessing when people get offended by you because you live a Christ-like life. You should thank God every day somebody spits on you and throws a rock at you. Metaphorically speaking. Not once does it tell us that, not twice, but almost 15 times in the New Testament it says, a lot of those written by Paul, that you should count it as a great blessing when people hate you because of Jesus. But you know the most important time that it's said in the New Testament is when Jesus said it himself. People are going to hate you because of me. When you let people know that you're a true follower of mine, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you so much they're going to want you dead. Sound familiar? Because it's happening in the world today, people. Truly, it is happening. The name of Jesus offends some so greatly that they would rather kill those people than to hear the name again. But you know what? I don't stand in judgment of them because God will judge them. But do you understand that I am no less of a sinner when I sit in a pew and I look down the row at me and I judge somebody for what they're wearing or what they're doing or if they're doing something that offends me and I sit in judgment? Do you know that's just as bad a sin? And don't ever fool yourself that it's not. Only one, only one will ever be able to judge you. And right now, all he has for you is love. If all he has for you and for me is perfect, uncompromising love, then what harm does it do when somebody says, you're an idiot for believing that? What harm does it do? You were all told as children, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, that's not really true. Because words do hurt, don't they? But you know what? When you suffer, listen, when you suffer, when you are hurting because your love of Jesus is so great that it cannot be denied, you are so blessed. And not only are you blessed in this life, but in the life to come. And when you kneel or lay down flat in front of Jesus and praise him and give him all glory for everything he's done, he's going to lift up your chin and he's going to say, well done. I loved you so much. And you did exactly what I asked you to do. I'll leave you with this. Jesus witnessed a Pharisee, one of the well-dressed, well-heeled men of the synagogue, praying openly and loudly on a street corner. Oh God, thank you for making me better than this beggar beside me. You don't remember that? You didn't read it? It's in there. Might want to dust it off. Oh God, thank you for making me better than this beggar beside me. 
And do you know what Jesus did? He walked over to the beggar and said, rise and walk. And he did. He didn't even look at the guy saying, thank you, because God was standing right there next to him. And he said, thank you for making me better than him. <sighs> Don't put yourself in a place where you think you're better than you are. Don't put yourself in a place where you sit in judgment of others. I don't care what they do because when you stand before God, you won't answer for that. But you will answer for judging them. Whatever it is that they do, they'll have to answer for. But I promise you, if you judge them on what they do or what they say or how they look or how they dress, you will. You will be judged for that. God is a great and merciful God and he wants everyone to be saved but there are some who don't want it. In fact, they don't want it so much that they would resort to, to physical violence. They would resort to, to murder rather than hear his name. So here's your challenge for this week. I gave you a challenge before. Five minutes. Just read your Bible for five minutes. Just pray for five minutes a day and watch what happens. Here's your challenge this week. When you see somebody doing something that you don't agree with, rather than judge them, pray for them. And it may be the hardest thing I've ever asked you to do. But I promise you, if you do it, you will see your life change in ways you can't imagine. As we pray and as the benediction happens, I'd like for you to stand and join me in prayer. <clears throat> God has been so wonderfully gracious to me when I didn't deserve it at all. When I hated the name of Jesus, he still loved me. And he still said, come back. So here is my prayer. Heavenly Father, no matter what I've done, no matter what I've said, please forgive me. Father, those who are praying right now at this moment. Give them that peace of spirit that allows them to know that no matter what they've said or no matter what they've done, that you still love them and have forgiveness readily available. And as we leave this place, but not God's presence, go with this knowledge that he loved you so much that he gave his son for you. Amen.